it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk on the theme, it's the, the title of the book, but it's a theme that we broadly discuss. Uh, and you could put it in another way, is the 21st century to be the Chinese century. This book is the result, and we'll talk about a number of these things, of about 35 to 40 Harvard Business School cases that I and uh, two colleagues at HBS have done, but also on the basis of historical and, and other research. But I think of, when you look at China in the 21st century, I always start, since I'm a historian, in the 20th, start uh, usually with this wonderful woman, uh, the Empress Dowager Tsushi, who, when I was Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard, I had a wonderful portrait of her outside of my office. It's in the Fog Art Museum. Uh, and I was, it was done by a Dutch portraitist in 1905, and she didn't like it because she said it made her look too old. Uh, <laughs> so I put it outside my office for protection, uh, as it were, and, uh, and it's very useful. Uh, but you get a sense of how quickly the world has changed when one thinks of her giving way to little Pui, and then finally to the man who used to be called the father of modern China, Sun so Yat-sen, the first provisional president of the Republic of China. And then you had Shikai. Now, the, if you were to go to any great library, New York Public, Widener Library, and to look at books that are published around the turn of the last century, and in particular at the beginning of the Republic of China, you would find books with the titles such as The Rise of China, The Dragon Awakes, The Ascent of China, Sun Yat Sen, and The Rise of China. And my favorite of this genre is a book entitled China's Rise an inevitable, if unwelcome, occurrence. <laughs> so today, you find books called The Rise of China, The Ascent of China. Uh, instead of Sun Yat-sen and The Rise of China, it's Deng Xiaoping and The Rise of China. The Dragon Awakes, same exact title. One of my students has written a book called As China Goes, So Goes the World. Another person has written a book called When China Rules the World. So if you remember nothing else from this talk, just remember this that most of these books are terrible. Mm. <laughs> Don't read them. Read mine. <laughs> and it's right there and available for you. Uh, it's interesting, you know, Yuan Shikai was to be, to inaug inaugurate the Republic and the Democratic Republic of China. And he actually asked the president of Harvard University, Charles Elliott, to send him a constitutional advisor to advise on how to establish a democratic republic. And President Elliott sent him an advisor who helped to write two constitutions for the new Republic of China. The first one made Yuan Shikai president for life, and the second one would have made him emperor if he had not died soon. I always tell my students that this is Harvard's contribution to Chinese democracy. <laughs> but the point here really is that, of course, China did not become a democracy in the Republican it became instead a highly militarized republic. If you look at John Desher, if you look at Peng Dehuai giving the international salute of the 1930s, uh, look at Mao Zedong, they're all cut from the same cloth. China became a highly militarized republic. And the military is the heart of the new state called China. And of course, it still is. This is this moment. I'm so sorry, come back. Uh, this is this moment in 2000. Uh, and four, I believe, two years into President Hu Jintao's tenure uh, as president and as party secretary, but only on this day is he number one in China because only on this day is he chairman of the Central Military Commission. And if you want to know, as you all know, I think, who is in charge in China from 1927 to the present, you need to know who is in charge of the Military Affairs Commission today. That, of course, is Mr. Xi Jinping. <coughs> and one can bemoan this fact, but one can also say that this is one of the reasons why China became a great power, not just recently, but by 1945, when it outlasted Japan in the Second Sino-Japanese War and became one of the founding members of the United Nations. And the point here is this very simple one, that China's rise in power is not just a last of the 20 or 30 years China doesn't exist simply since 1978, but over the last 100 years. And China's military power is a century in the making. The same is true, I would argue, and we argue in this book, of China's economic power and of uh, modern entrepreneurship. This is Shanghai in 1909. Here's Shanghai in 1930, when Shanghai, not Hong Kong, a pathetic, pathetic colonial backwater in comparison 
not Tokyo, not Seoul, Hong Kong, the Shanghai, Shanghai is the great entrepot and the great cultural center uh, of East Asia, home to the first bourgeoisie, at least, or individuals with bourgeois aspirations, home to China's first uh, golden age of capitalism, modern capitalism that we're now living uh, in the second uh, and you can get a sense of this if you look at one of our cases, it's the case of Mr. Lu Guanzhou, uh, a gentleman born in the Republican period, a man born to be a businessman outside of Hangzhou. He tried to start his first business at the height of the Great Leap Forward. Not a great idea. Mm. He tried to start a business then at the height of the Cultural Revolution. These are not his partners. <laughs> <laughs> but he does start in 1969 in a Renin Gong shirt in a people's commune, a small thing, tractor repair shop in a people's commune is a sure great By 1979, it's making universal joints for cars. Talk to Harvard undergraduates about cars, they really don't know how they work anymore. And I mentioned, what is a universal joint? And I have to explain to the undergraduate, it is not something that you smoke and pass around. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the same site today. And of course, Wan Chang, this company, is now uh, the largest auto, they have 65% of the auto parts market in China, the largest automobile manufacturing company. This is a man whose roots in entrepreneurship date back really to the 30s and 40s, now one of the great entrepreneurs of modern China. Uh, and when, and this is the Chicago headquarters of Wan Chang uh, that is uh, now owns 28 American auto parts companies and is just about to be building uh, an electric car. And if you ask Mr. Lu, what is the secret of your success? Naturally, he being a smart businessman, he thanks the government uh, for all of this success. If you ask him, Mr. Lu, what's the real secret of your success? He said to me, well, Mr. Kirby, you know, as long as there's a human race that will be Chinese, and as, there, as long as there is a market, you will have people from Zhejiang. <laughs> the genetic explanation. Uh, and this is his electric car factory. Uh, uh, and we did a case on him, uh, and we actually uh, filmed our MOOC, our online course, a little bit on him. And wonderful thing, he gets everything right. Wan Chung visiting them, except the name of the Harvard Business Harvard. <laughs> so China's rise in business, without question, is also a century and more in the making. And the same, I argue, is true in education. Here's an educational compound that has to be used in 1905. And then a shift to a highly internationalized format of education. Here's Yanjin University, now the center of Peking University, uh, an extraordinary joint venture. Uh, 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 at the time, here's uh, the original uh, architectural drawings for Nanjing University. China is home in the first part of the 20th century to one of the most extraordinary systems of higher education in the world, public and private, Chinese and foreign, one of the most dynamic in the world, small but very high quality. Here's National Central University, uh, modeled on the greatest university in the world in 1930, which is what? Oxford. No. Berlin. Berlin. I read the book. He read the book. See? <laughs> <laughs> and you know it's modeled on the, on the uh, University of Berlin because there's a Brandenburg Gate welcoming you into it. Uh, and still there, although under a different name. Or you look at Tsinghua University that begins as a prep school to send Chinese abroad with American return boxer uh, indemnity money uh, with an American-style campus, which is a spinning image, literally. Uh, of the uh, great quadrangle at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. has this Midwestern look, even today, and uh, became a great comprehensive university. My teacher, John Fairbank, learned his Chinese history from a great historian, Zhang Tingfu, right here at Tsinghua uh, University. And its architectural history mirrors the intellectual and political history of modern China, because the Tsinghua of the 1950s looks like Moscow State. Uh, and it becomes a polytechnic university. Mm -hmm. But today it is coming back, and we'll come back to Tsinghua a little bit later on. So the 21st century builds on the 20th century in a broad way, not just in the last 20 or 30 years. And if we're to look to the 21st century at areas where China can lead, I'm going to talk about three very briefly. Infrastructure, entrepreneurship, and education, before drawing a few conclusions. Infrastructure. 
Sun Yat-sen may or may not be the father of modern China, but he is the father of the modern engineering state. His book, The International Development of China, the most ambitious development scheme ever come out, 1920, 1921. Uh, you can see it, for example, in his plan for the Chinese Railway Network of 1921. An extraordinary plan, and if you were to map this and overlay it with the rail, rails that have actually been built in modern China under Guomindang and Gongchangdang auspices, it's a remarkable uh, congruence. Uh, this is the Chinese railway plan for 2020, still not quite as extensive. So it gets in, actually, of these railways, you know, Outer Mongolia is China's. So, uh, but even Sun Yat-sen did not have the ambition or the imagination to have a railroad to Taiwan, which is on the plan for 2020. Uh, well, I don't know if they told Ma Ying-jeou uh, about that particular plan. But he set in motion an engineering state, first under nationalist auspices, to be realized in Taiwan, and then after 1978 on the mainland. And China today, I tell my students, really, if you want to understand what is China today, it is a dictator, it's what Sun Yat-sen called technocracy. He translated the term technocracy as the dictatorship of the engineers. And there's probably no better description for China's government over the last uh, several decades than a dictatorship of the engineers. And I see this, in many of my best friends are engineers. I'm not against engineers at all. And Americans, <coughs> Americans are run by lawyers. I don't, I don't know what I prefer on some ways. Uh, in any event, of course, you know, you see things built in China, the likes of which we will never see in our lifetime in this country. Uh, Beijing subway, 2003, 2008, <coughs> 2013. What's the biggest new infrastructure project you imagine in Boston? Oh, that's already done. Oh, that's the next one. What's the next one? There's none, basically. It is. Mm. Actually, it's a four mile extension of the Green Line. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, enough said. It's, and it probably won't happen. Too many lawyers. Three uh, <laughs> Gorges Dam, first proposed by Sun Yat sen in 1921, now completed. Uh, uh, is uh, the Qingdao Bay Bridge, you know, infrastructure of a kind that is just difficult to imagine in a country that once, our country, which once led uh, in infrastructure, even in places that are not historically part of core uh, China. Kashgar, for example, gets to watch the Olympics in 2008, whether they want to or not. Um, to test this infrastructure state, I went to Lhasa at one point to see, we were doing a case on China Mobile. Would my mobile phone work there? A, a phone that every night when I drove home from Cambridge to Lexington, Massachusetts, it cuts out in Belmont, Massachusetts, every night. Uh, and so my wife gave me a call from the Great Wall. No problem. Getting <laughs> this is an infrastructure state that is unleashed and in many ways unchecked. It has made Chongqing, for example, to turn now to entrepreneurship. A Manhattan on the Yangtze. You know that Chongqing because it's an ocean-going port now, 1,500 miles uh, upriver, thanks to the Three Gorges project. And you know it's a Manhattan on the Yangtze because this building is called New York, New York. Uh, and it's in the center of Liberation Square. And you can get a sense of how China has changed by just going to Liberation Square in Chongqing. Here you have the Liberation Monument, built by John Kaishek to celebrate liberation against the Japanese, renamed by Mao Zedong to celebrate liberation from John Kaishek. <laughs> and now redesigned to celebrate liberation, I guess, from, from socialism, or at least Maoism, because there's now a Rolex clock at the top <laughs> of the Liberation Square. And if you go to Liberation Square, I can guarantee you, you will be liberated from your money. By stores <laughs> like this Cartier, uh, or this fancy Chinese store. Uh, it's also home to extraordinary entrepreneurship and innovation in agribusiness and in agriculture. I did a case on the CP group, the Zhengda Jituan, this overseas Chinese group now headquartered in Thailand, but active in 30 different Chinese provinces, which has reimagined Chinese agriculture, an agricultural revolution without a land revolution, from farm to fork in an integrated supply chain controlling the agronomy, uh, uh, the animal husbandry, right down to the lotus supermarkets that uh, the CP group also controls uh, an extraordinary <coughs> change where you can go and buy these certifiably green eggs uh, of the CP group in all of their 
in all of their glory. Green eggs that even in China go reasonably well with ham. Uh, if you were to look at the most extraordinary development of agriculture, I, I did a film of the CP Group's uh, huge uh, agricultural ecological garden plan on Hangzhou Bay, reclaimed land. It's about 100 square kilometers. Uh, all of it, everything in it is recycled. So you have mammoth amounts of uh, rice and wheat uh, seasonally overturned over here, uh, vegetables and, and fruits over here, all fertilized by the one to three million laying chicken, egg, egg laying chickens who are here, who when they are done with their job are recycled here to become chicken soup up in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. And when they die a bit prematurely on the job, uh, go over here to the alligator farm. Mm -hmm. um, and the alligators presumably are recycled to Louis Vuitton. I'm not entirely. <laughs> uh, in agribusiness as well, we have a case on the EMI, uh, whose mission in life in Inner Mongolia is to keep cows from wandering around aimlessly like this and to doing some serious work like this. Mm -hmm. And who had the great mission of convincing hundreds of millions of Chinese who don't like milk and who are 70% lactose intolerant to drink it. Uh, something that they've done with extraordinary success, both in chemistry and in marketing. And the uh, president of it came to HBS the first time we, we gave this uh, case. And he gave every Harvard Business School student two quarts of Ely milk. And they're all fine. <laughs> We have a case on the wine industry uh, as well, uh, and an industry on Grace Vineyard, a very good vineyard in, in, in Shanxi province. It's a case is called Appellation Shanxi. And later on, if we have time for a wine seminar, I can talk uh, in greater length about how changing features of agriculture are not only serving modern and urban tastes, but transforming and enriching the countryside in a way unimaginable just decades uh, ago. So in infrastructure and in entrepreneurship, China clearly has the capacity to be. What about education? This is this moment in 1977 when the uh, universities reopened, when China had less than 500,000 university students. China today, China by 1990 had 2 million. By the year 2000, had 6 million university students. Today, China has 32 million university students. And you see the growth of higher education, the most extraordinary growth in the history of higher education happening in China today. This is one of the new campuses of Zhejiang University. This is another of the new campuses of Zhejiang University, uh, a place that has now about 70,000 students and all of them put together. Uh, this is a, a, a eating hall at Zhejiang University. 10,000 students can eat at once. Uh, here's another new building at Zhejiang University. This is a very edgy and modern place. It's set in Zhejiang. Again, very edgy. And they even have an institute called the Zhang Jiexu Yu Jin Dai Zhong Guo Yan Zhong Jin, a Zhang Kai shek, a modern Chinese history research center. Because Zhang Kai shek is a hero in Zhejiang. And I even got to meet Zhang Kai shek. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or an actor who looks rather like him. Um, uh, but you can see these extraordinary developments in higher education. Uh, aiming for 200 million, already there nearly, in higher education institutions, aiming for a 40% uh, enrollment rate of college-age students uh, over time uh, by 2040, the growth of private institutions in higher education as well. Uh, here's one. We did a Harvard Business School case on this one, Mr. Uh, Xi'an Weishishui and Xi'an International University. Mr. Huang Tung doesn't have to worry about being a university president, what his tenure is. You may or may not know this, but it's not easy to be a university president. The average tenure of an American university president is shorter than the average tenure of an undergraduate in college. <laughs> Undergraduates take longer than you think. Uh, but nevertheless, he did not have to worry about it because he owns 55% of Xi'an International University. <coughs> uh, and a British private equity firm owns the other 45. Uh, and you see the world changing. Peking University, Tsinghua University, now in the top 50 of the rankings to which every dean and every president the world over pays at least some attention, although they claim not to. They all do. 
If these rankings, if you went back to 1913, probably eight of the top 10 universities in the world would have been German universities. The other two would have been British. <coughs> Harvard, certainly not in the top 10, maybe not even in the top 20. Today, not one of the top 50 universities in the world, by any measure, is a German university, by any ranking. The world changes, and it can change in this round, rather fast. Uh, this is why the world of universities is coming to China. University of Nottingham in Ningbo, a place that has never had a university, has an exact replica of the University of Nottingham, Nottingham. University of Liverpool, Suzhou, an engineering college, now with 7,000 students. Stanford University has a uh, China Europe Business School, a joint venture with the China, uh, with the European Union. Columbia University has an office and center in Beijing, Chicago also. NYU Shanghai is now in its second year of operation. I'm sorry, it's in its first, first year. second year. Second I'm sorry, it's just started its second year of operation. Uh, the Harvard, we have a center in Shanghai, which I oversee. And the only thing wrong with this picture is that we don't yet have the whole building. Uh, uh, but it has an HPSI classroom, and it is a meeting place, a convening place, and a research center as well. Duke University uh, in Kunshan, maybe the most ambitious project since the founding of Genjing University in 1928, a 200-acre residential campus that has just opened its doors uh, this fall in the wealthiest small city in China, in Kunshan. <coughs> and Tsinghua University itself, a place that began, if you remember, as a place to send Chinese away, is now welcoming through Schwarzman College, funded here in New York by Stephen Schwarzman, the Blackstone Group, uh, an extraordinary venture to bring the best and the brightest of the world in a 21st century version of the Rhodes Scholar, not to a drizzly, passe island like Eagle, but to Beijing uh, instead uh, in a residential college that will open in 2016. And so a Chinese university that began <coughs> its mission to send Chinese abroad to then come back is now welcoming the world. So if you ask the question, now let me wind toward a conclusion here. If you ask the question, if you look at infrastructure and if you look at entrepreneurship, and if you look at education, they, the question has to be, how can China not lead? Well, this is maybe one reason. <laughs> and I don't mean him personally. But take the case of Bo Xilai. And what are the lessons that we draw from the case of Bo Xilai? Bo Xilai was a regional, well, oh, sorry. Bo Xilai is a prince. He was the son of a somebody, son of a member of a great family. In Guomindang times, it used to be said there were four great families. Maybe today there are 40 great families, more rich and more influential than any in Guomindang times. When the throne is open, historically in China, the princes of the great families will buy for the throne. This prince lost, and this prince won. Second, Bo Xilai is a regional leader. He was in absolute control of Chongqing until the moment he was not. <coughs> In the 1930s, we would have called him a warlord. Warlord, you must remember this. Warlord is what you call losers. If you win, you become chairman. <laughs> Third, very close ties to the military. Military very much split in this moment uh, of power struggle over the last year and a half and two. Uh, and the military remained both its supporter and ultimately his undoing. Uh, fourth, he used the justice system to get his enemies mercilessly, and then his enemies used the justice system to get him and his wife in these ludicrous trials that we watched last year. Uh, and then fifth, he is said to be corrupt. But the level of corruption of which he was accused is really a kind of a small town stuff. But it's not easy not to be corrupt when your official salary as the leader of an entire province is $12,000 US. Uh, in all of these things, in being tied to great families, in being a regional leader, close ties to the military, abusing the justice system, and said to be corrupt, of course, Bo Xilai is not the exception to the rule. Perhaps he is the rule. 
in a political system that desperately needs to reform itself in the way that other parts of China have done. Uh, and this is the great challenge, I think, for President Xi Jinping, a great challenge for his standing committee, which, as you can see, stands very well uh, <laughs> together. Uh, same Taylor, I think. Uh, and yet, the question to be asked is, what is their role model for the future? Was it a good sign when they went uh, on the 120th anniversary of the death, of the birth, I'm sorry, of Mao Zedong, to visit the chairman in the same week that uh, Prime Minister Abe went uh, to the Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo? Maybe Japan isn't the only country having some difficulty dealing with its history. The point that I would make here is, though, the question is not whether China can lead. Whether China can lead, and I think it certainly has the capacity to do so, will depend on who leads China. Uh, will it continue to be individuals like this? And, uh, will it be people like this? Great entrepreneurs like Zhang Dongsheng, the head of the Zhongguo Chia Jia Luntan, the head of the China Entrepreneurs Forum, <coughs> private business people who are transforming the landscape in a way that state enterprise actually never has. People like Wang Shi, people like, of course, now Jack Ma. Everyone knows Jack Ma, but there are a lot of other people you should know. Uh, uh, who is, whose company Alibaba has done more to transform uh, the way business is done across China and between businesses than any government agency. Will it be people like this? This is the Zhonghua Chia Jia Luntan in their annual gathering in Yabuli in Manchuria. Or will it be those who walk through these gates? The people, the future graduates of Tsinghua and other ch great Chinese universities who can determine China's future in the 21st century. I don't know the answer to this, but let me just conclude by saying that can China lead? Can the 21st century be the Chinese century? Mm -hmm. The answer, I think, is yes. But if so, it cannot be <coughs> China alone. China cannot thrive alone, cannot need alone, uh, and cannot need without a continuing era of peace. But second, if it is to be the Chinese century, it won't have been the first, and it won't be the last. Thank you very much. That bill, that is terrific. It makes me want to take the online course. Yeah. Too late, too late <laughs> to sign up? Absolutely. No, no, no. It's free. It's free. I know. Shame is foolish. <laughs> you and I have discussed the business model there. But I guess it's yes. not, not for today's discussion. Isn't the answer when you look at all the who's going to lead? The answer is all of the above. And then the role, if you look at the Korean example, and you, that when they were authoritarian, authoritarian, and you look at the Taiwan example, when they were authoritarian, and what they, the, the new governments have done was allow the private sector to, to lead in the business area, to allow academics to have their freedom. And isn't, isn't that the answer? And that's going to determine what, whether China leads or not? I think that's a huge part of the answer. But part of my concern is that while we see a continuing capacity for economic reform, I think there has been a much greater tightening in the political sphere. Really, first under President Hu, and then in particular under, under President Xi, in a, in a way that doesn't give me confidence of, a, of, a, uh, of the capacity to think of new directions also in politics. Uh, and, you know, the interests <coughs> of the Chinese Communist Party and the interests of China are not permanently coterminous. Uh, and this is, this is a challenge. And many people in the party, of course, know and understand this extremely well. Uh, know it better than we do, uh, without question. About I've talked at the Zhongyang Dangxiao on a number of occasions. Really extraordinary people worrying and thinking about China's future. But I don't yet see the imagination. I mean, China is. I, you know, I used to tell my students, you know, China has been very fortunate, particularly uh, uh, since uh, the 1980s, uh, Zhao Ziyang, Yu Yabang, 90s. And they've, had, it's been, they've had a leadership that, by any comparative international standard, has been well governed. And it's a system that needs good leaders in order to work. And I used to tell my students that the Americans, by contrast, could be governed by any idiot. 
uh, and we'd muddle through. I think we, we, we have, actually, I'm not, I'm not so sure that I believe that anymore um, after the George W. Bush years, but that's a good uh, matter. Uh, and, uh, but I think, I think there are, this is the area that gives me greatest points of view. If you were to look at universities, for example, extraordinary experimentation in every Chinese university in the area of what we would call in this country liberal education. Peking University, Fudan University, uh, Zhejiang University, they all are establishing their own liberal arts colleges, just as NYU and Duke are on an international model, believing that the next generation of leaders won't be just engineers, but will need to be broadly trained and broadly educated. Uh, to be creative problem solvers for the 21st So the Chinese leadership believes this, and the leadership of these universities believe this. So then the question is, and it's an unanswered question yet, can you have a great system of liberal education in a politically illiberal system? The German answer of the 19th century is <coughs> maybe you can, but only if there's some insulation of the universities from politics only if they have some autonomy within it. So this is, this is where the, the wild card really here is, the risk for China is, in my view, almost entirely political risk. Not in terms of imagination, not in terms of ingenuity or innovation, but really what can be the political breaks on this great story of, of resurgence. The, it hasn't been an accident that the people who have run China are well trained that they have this organization department which does a good job. Kind of, it's kind of like military personnel where they make sure that the people who reach the you know, Fu Buji level, the Buji level, or the Fu Zong level <coughs> have actually gone through the right training. Don't you think that's think a that's system that's kind of, it's, I always joke when, when, I'm, when I'm talking about American politics in, in China, and let's say we have a, a cabinet officer who really doesn't understand his portfolio, and I say, the <laughs> you know, the, the, the organization department wouldn't have chosen him. You know, again, this, has a, this is a model of, uh, of long standing. You, know, you go back to Chen Lifu and Chen Wofu, who ran the organization department of Kuomintang yep. in the 1920s and 30s. And then in Taiwan, actually a very important part of local governance uh, in Taiwan, so it is a model that has great power and strength, and you avoid having, you know, Rob Ford would not become mayor of Toronto <laughs> if Canada had a system uh, right. such as this. It is the question, however, of, in some sense, accountability, uh, accountability locally, uh, accountability particularly to local constituencies. China is a great and diverse country, uh, and both under Qing and, and uh, modern times, its capacity to have both strong local self-government, which has been an aim of almost every reforming regime, including the communists in the early days, and strong central government, I think is essential for its long-term capacity. Uh, the Qing ruled different parts of this empire in different ways. And the Qing lasted for 268 years, which is longer than the American Republic has been around. In the book, you make the argument that the economic model that China has used over the last 35 years has about, it, it's ended its useful life. And you need, you need, even though it's been successful, it needs reform. Talk about that and talk about whether you think that the 12th five-year plan and the third plenum reforms reflect an understanding by the Chinese leadership that actually agrees with you that they understand this economic model has come to the end of its useful life. I think that is true. I think they, both in terms of it being an export net model, and the need to develop uh, stronger domestic uh, markets, the need to build a real system of social security uh, for future consumers, the need to reform state-owned enterprises that still to this day, and really have become stronger since the year 2000 uh, uh, in, in many sectors, uh, they, on paper, it all absolutely uh, would follow <coughs> the, the uh, if not advice, at least the conclusions of, of this book. The question is whether this will be implemented in as dramatic a way as has been set out. It doesn't fill me, I worry a little bit, it doesn't fill me with confidence that the man whose job initially 
where, you know, historically the premier uh, has been to run the economy. Uh, premier Li Keqiang has not really been at the forefront of this effort in a way that his predecessors were. And we, shall, we shall have to see. I, 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 the jury is out. The problems identified, without question, I think are the right problems to, to identify. You talk briefly in the book about Alibaba. Mm. Obviously, the book was written before these extraordinary events. A but not before I bought shares. But before, obviously, this extraordinary public issue, which values the company at in excess of $200 billion. And Alibaba is obviously playing this incredible role in China, allowing them to some degree to skip over kind of <coughs> bricks and mortar. Talk about China leading in that area and in other areas where, in other words, China may not lead in every area, but it may lead in a lot of areas. So in, in some sense, it's both a regional and a national story. So Alibaba, also from Jejo. Jejo, a hotbed of entrepreneurship for centuries, home of the nationalist regime, almost no communist SOEs. In there. And you have in, in Jack Ma a guy who understands, like many successful private Chinese business people, Success means going where the government isn't. The government isn't giving information on how to start uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. He is now going to do that uh, through his Taobao Dashue, Taobao University, which aims mm -hmm. to have a million students online, teaching them how to start and run and helping to fund them in small and medium-sized enterprises. He has made it possible for people to trade with each other, businesses across geographic areas that were impossible before to get people. You know, one of the greatest problems in Chinese business is whom do you trust? You know you don't trust the government, by and large. That's historically true under whatever government. Uh, how do you know what partner you can trust uh, in a world in which family business is only now coming back? Families are much smaller than ever before. You can trust people from your hometown up to a point. You can trust clients. But how do you get trusting people whom you've never met over large distances? This, he has moved into this area in an extraordinary way and allowed for long distance trade across uh, barriers that had all kinds of cultural and political as well as economic restrictions upon them. And I think what he's done is truly innovative and extraordinary. He also has, I have to say, a, an enormous amount of cheekiness to him uh, in, in a refreshing way. I was at the what was called the Taobao Wutai, this big party that he gives for Taobao every year. This was a couple of years ago in, in, in Hangzhou. And he closed this big pep rally for all of his employees in Taobao by saying, you know, congratulations. You know, state-owned enterprises, he said, are good because they're state-owned. They're big because they're state-owned. We're big because we're good. <laughs> he said, Taman Shi, so wait a going chia. We are the real national champions. We are the ones that the country should be proudest of. Or the, and, and, and he did a number of other things that only he could get away with. What about the climate change? You have this wonderful chapter on the engineering state, which really you make reference to in your talk, too. But in a way, is China better equipped to lead on climate change than the United States because of the way our political system runs? I think our political system doesn't run at all. Uh, so I think we have great, enormous challenges uh, in, in a political, in an 18th century political model in this country that does not seem to be up to the challenges of the 21st century. China has an early 20th century political model, also a Western one. Uh, and yet, in this area, I would say that, of course, uh, China's you know, catching up with the rest of the world from 1978 uh, to the present has, brought, has come with enormous environmental costs, in part because China has a longer continuous history of environmental degradation than any place on Earth, going back thousands of years. Uh, in, in terms of the pressure of human beings on the land. And yet, at the same time, it has a strong enough government and scientifically well-informed enough government that if it has the political will to overcome its own large internal constituents, such as the oil industry and, and the automobile industry and, and other words, it has the capacity to do more, more quickly, I think, than any other major, major country. I want to open the the Florida 
to questions. Before doing that, I just have one last question, which is I would be remiss in not uh, asking you as one of the leading authorities on modern Chinese history about the history of student protest in China and how we should be thinking about the student-led demonstrations in Hong Kong that is so much in everybody's mind today. Well, student-led protest, if you look at any nationalist or communist historiography, is a good thing as long as it's against warlords uh, or Japanese. Uh, and mm -hmm. tends not to be a great thing if it's against you. Um, so I, you know, there's a long and rich history of patriotic student movements, of which I think this is, will be written at the end of the day as one. Um, I think the Hong Kong situation is more complicated than others, in, in part because the political situation in Hong Kong is more complicated. I see this kind of uprising of Hong Kong students as a second chapter in what was their, uh, the first one being the anti-patriotic education campaign of two years ago, in which they understandably did not want to be fed a comic book version of Chinese history as their comrades on the mainland have to endure. Uh, that said, um, where it goes, the, Hong Kong is a much more complicated place. I hope this doesn't happen, but here's one scenario. When I think of Hong Kong, it reminds me as a historian of a 19th century kind of German principality, a place where there's a designated prince, uh, a partially elected legislature, and, a dysfun and, and an increasingly vocal population. Uh, and so Hong Kong today may have good people in government. Sure, it has had very good people in government. But the position of chief executive in Hong Kong is a position of authority without legitimacy. The position of the legislature in Hong Kong is having legitimacy without authority. And then you have a permanent civil service uh, that has respect but no political base. This reminds me in some sense, you have to know some German history, Germany in the pre-1848 uh, it means really to great aspirations and great hopes for change that in that case would be turning points in history where history didn't turn. I hope in Hong Kong, both the leaders in Beijing and in, in Hong Kong, and the leaders of the student movement can look at to see how one can have a stable and ever more democratic Hong Kong without a catastrophe. Um, one of the great ironies, of course, is this is occurring at a time when there's actually progress being made. It's always, it's when there is some progress that people say, well, it's not sufficient. It's kind of what times when, over history, when revolutions do occur. But, but this is, this is again, what worries me about Hong Kong. When political change comes, as in 1848 or in other great cycles of revolutions across the world, it comes like that. Uh, and unless you prepare carefully for political change, uh, it can overwhelm you and overwhelm you. And what worries me in the Chinese context is the lack of at least overt preparation for some political change that is inevitable. Because, you know, I'm just saying, speaking as a You're historian. You're talking about in China now, not in China. I'm Hong talking now in China. Right. Um, because the fact of the matter is, no political party anywhere rules forever. Uh, and the question isn't if it's when and how there's some political change in China, uh, and ideally one that is stable uh, and builds on the successes of the last 35 years. So Jerry, question. Where does corruption fit into this picture? There's no corruption in China. <laughs> um, um, you know, that's a, such a difficult question because Corruption is endemic in China by most comparative standards, in part because of the opacity of the political system, but mostly, and this is something you can say much more than I, that in part one area where political change is not happening. When I speak about political change, I certainly do not mean automatically an American system or even an actual system in the way, but one in which, for example, uh, the judiciary is honest and well compensated the police are apolitical, in which people can have confidence in using the courts to settle disputes, increasingly happening in some in commercial areas, absolutely. 
uh, but not in, uh, not in many other areas. Corruption is endemic in part, and this is not just a communist thing, it was also a nationalist thing, it was a Qing thing, because public officials are compensated so poorly in terms of their formal compensation. You cannot be a public official in China simply on an official salary. We pay graduate students more than the president of China gets in his annual salary, in his official annual salary. We don't give them free housing and cars and airplanes and things like this, but nevertheless, it's, so it's a system in which, so it means that you can always get someone for corruption. Because everyone has to be, in some way or other, past some certain line. But I am not, you know, I, I, I'm not one, there are statistics that gauge comparative corruptions across countries. I, do, I don't know how one measures it best. But Singapore, Hong Kong are Chinese societies with a distinctive British tradition. Uh, they have essentially met corruption in and they pay their officials extremely well. Right. So the question really is, why does the Chinese government not see that and do something about it? Well, one of the great challenges for Chinese governments all across the 20th century, because China has had, for example, more men under arms than any other part of the world. How do you demobilize soldiers safely? So think of the question, how do you demobilize officials? China has many more officials. Uh, per capita, even, than it has ever had uh, in its long history of very successful bureaucracies. And so this would be a major challenge both at the local and the municipal and at the provincial and other that lots of people, un, unemployed and disaffected officials are not good necessarily for political stability. So this is a, a huge challenge for your organization department. You make them make, judges. You make them judges. <laughs> <laughs> you make them judges. I don't know. It's, it's an enormous, I mean, Okay. John, uh, uh, how can you have? Uh, John, uh, there's, there's a microphone for you. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Um, how can you develop this wonderful country uh, with the educational system they have, with absolutes, and the students are taught chapter and verse about everything, and it's fair, it's extremely packaged and vetted and the line. And so they don't, even sophisticated students in the best universities don't see beyond that. Some don't see beyond it, but I disagree with you. I've taught, I'm a visiting professor at eight or nine Chinese universities. And I've given lectures to freshmen, to graduate students, so all kinds of things. And I have found them to be in, you know, full of inquiry, full of energy and insight. Uh, they know when they're fed power. <laughs> Really, uh, most do, not all, of course. And you know, there, there are these required courses of Mali, or you know, uh, everything. Uh, what you have to do is Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, three represents, etc., etc., etc. But you know, there are some very edgy teaching fellows and young professors who teach these things in a very edgy and interesting way. So it isn't automatic. There are some rather extraordinary party secretaries of Chinese universities <coughs> that have led them in a more open form of inquiry. And to give you an example of the independent mindedness of, uh, I was giving a lecture uh, to the history department of Fudan a couple years ago. Big, packed hall. Uh, and of course, I thought it was a great lecture. Uh, anyway, they are, this one kid in the back stands up and he says, yeah, Professor Kirby, thank you for your wonderful lecture. Uh, did you know that we all were forced to come to hear you? <laughs> <laughs> and the president of the university is next to me. He's really pissed. Uh, and, and, this, and I said, thank you for telling me that, and I think it's a good thing you were forced to come. Uh, but they then, the, 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 so the, the dean and the president were going to, I got a letter of apology from this person, and I said, no, you've got to be nice to this kid. This kid, you know, I was delighted that he felt that he was in an environment where he could just speak out. And I've, but on so many areas, I've heard the same thing. So I, I think we, there's this uh, mythology that the Americans, the Americans talk more, but they don't necessarily have more to say. Um, uh, and, 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 and there's a mythology that you know, the Americans are innovative and creative and so on, the Chinese are passive learners. I, I don't believe it's true. You aren't the greatest continuous civilization in world history by not reinventing yourself now and again. Nick, Nick. Um, 
Bill, does your book uh, go into the dynamic between economic reform and political reform? Here you have um, a system which is advocating much more responsibility to the free market. And at the same time, it is a system that is aggregating it to itself and to the party control over everything. Right. That strikes me as being a gigantic contradiction. And I wonder if anyone's really tried to grasp the connection between the two. I mean, what happens if you give more responsibility to the free market? What does it do uh, to your to party control? What does it do to the things that the party holds dear? So the, I'll put it another way. Can you have, and I think you can have, but is it healthy for China to have a free market in goods and services and not a free market in ideas? Well, but can, can you escape one from the other? You can try. But I think if you, if you were to, this is, this is what worries me about China. If you were to look at the debates about China's future 100 years ago, the people who are writing about where China should go as a republic, at the end of the Qing or into the republic, you see extraordinary talent. You know, people like Yan Fu to begin with, or people like uh, Liang Qichao, uh, people like Li Da Zhao, uh, uh, people like Hu Shi, Ding Wenjiang, Hong Wenhao, and others. People who were deeply knowledgeable in Chinese history and culture. Many of them had passed the imperial exams. And at the top of their fields in the world, in whatever discipline they were in, those people are not permitted to write as openly or critically today. They don't exist in quite the same level today. But the, what passes for public debate on the future of China is a thin gruel, intellectually speaking. And I think China needs more exchange of ideas, uh, not just in, within the party, but nationally, to think. Because th there is much talent uh, to be had. I don't think you can keep this. You know, you cannot have, for example, you know, this uh, last year, a year and a half ago, I was running a conference in our Shanghai Center on civil society in China. A lot of Chinese participants. And they, we were running our conference on the very day that this document number nine from the party came out uh, about seven things you can't talk about. Qi bu zhang. Seven things you... Civil society number four. As a result, everybody was talking about civil society. But the fact is, you really cannot... You can't treat the Chinese people like children forever. They're not. Yes, Hi, I actually had a, a, a similar question um, and going back to specifically as Ambassador Platt to um, Tiananmen Square and what we saw happen there between um, between um, Deng Xiaoping and uh, Zhao Ziyang, where uh, the the outcome, I mean, in simplest terms, was that uh, Zhao Ziyang had hoped you could have political reform at the same time as economic reform, and Deng Xiaoping thought you had to have economics first, and then. Like, you know, hopefully political uh, reform would follow. All this time later, you know, we haven't really seen it happen. And now, as you said, starting with Hu Jintao, you, you've seen almost a tightening of the leadership. And under Xi Jinping, just, just looking at them all standing up there, you don't get a sense that this is going to um, get any easier. So I guess my question is, and maybe part of this will be answered in what's going on in Hong Kong, but how do you see this playing out under the current leadership going forward under Xi Jinping? I mean, is he going to come down and somehow find a way to allow these two to grow in parallel, or are we going to have you know, this very heavy hand uh, come down, which if it does, after all this time after Tiananmen Square, it, it really says something about the potential of the country potential. Well, on the one hand, the evidence so far is not in that direction. The evidence is of a much tighter political line, uh, refusing to discuss bad things in the party's history in the past, refusing to deal with un unpleasantnesses and a strong crackdown on any form of dissent. That said, you know, the fact is these systems do not have... I've met Mr. Xi Jinping twice. I met Mr. Hu Jintao uh, three or four times, uh, John Smith several times. I have no idea what they think, right? They're, if they're smart, they won't tell me. Um, um, uh, and these systems, I remember when I was a young assistant professor, I went to Taiwan, it was 1984, I think. I went to a conference in Taiwan, and Li Donghui was the leading speaker. 
this was an old style Guomindang history conference. So why the Guomindang was always right, the communists always wrong. And he gave this hard line anti-communist speech, anti-Taiwan independence, anti-everything. Uh, it was one of these beneficial <coughs> speeches where everybody has a copy of the speech, the guy's reading the same speech, people were pretending to take notes, and things of this sort. And it turns out he believed nothing of what he was saying. Uh, I don't know what Mr. Xi Jinping really believes in his heart is his mission uh, for China's political development over the next <coughs> 10 years. We know what his actions so far are, but these are not systems that uh, now is really why you have to look in some, in some sense not at plans but at actions. So far these actions are not ones that would lead one to imagine political liberalization. And yet he is in the he's the one person in a position perhaps uh, to begin to do so in a, in a, in a, from a position of strength and stability. Yeah. In the Deng Xiaoping era, you know, I think of political freedoms as going, you know, straight up like this. And I'm and I'm of the mind that economic you know, development, economic change, <coughs> political change. I mean, just like in the example you talked about Jack Ma, I mean, that has allowed individuals, you know, space to talk about, to operate in a way that has been, you know, never existed in the communist, in, in communist China. So I think we focus too much on politics. And I think if we focus on economics, everything will come along eventually. You know, I mean, it's creating enormous private space to operate. The Chinese citizens maybe have never had in Chinese civilization history. I mean, I agree with that. Well, I don't disagree that the Chinese people, but I think this might be possible under a wide range of political systems, are better off than they have ever been. Sure. Uh, uh, Bill, uh, I'm sorry. You're, 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 uh, uh, I'm sorry. It is. It is. It is. Sorry, we got a. Here you are. It is sometimes uh, mentioned, uh, alleged, that there are two examples of events abroad which influence Chinese leadership thinking. Uh, and I don't know whether or not to pay attention to that theory, and I wonder if you do. One is that uh, Beijing is very conscious of how Moscow fell apart, and they're not going to let any <coughs> of that sort of thing uh, occur. Second is that uh, Singapore is a great place. And you can keep the control while allowing a lot of uh, personal freedom and economic freedom, but not endanger your control. Do you think either of these examples really are of any interest to the Beijing Taliban? <coughs> I think they're both uh, of great interest. I think Singapore is a useful model for Shanghai, or for Guangzhou, uh, Shenzhen. I don't think it's a useful model for a huge, diverse, and complicated country with many cultures, many. Uh, many divisions, economic and, and otherwise. Uh, the Russian, you know, I take totally different, I'm a historian, so I have some credentials in this. I take a different look at that history. Who killed international communism as a global movement? Nobody did more than China. Mao Zedong destroyed it when he destroyed the Sino-Soviet alliance, really for no good reason in the late 1950s, at least from China's national interests not for good reasons, for his own ideological uh, point of view and for his own sense of himself as Stalin's successor, understandable, that named international consciousness. But if you look at the history of 1989 in Europe, uh, GDR and the mm -hmm. Soviet Union and then afterwards, with the fall of Eastern Europe, what China did in Tiananmen so delegitimized, you know, which was seen on television screens all across the Eastern Bloc, and even and in Russia, so delegitimized communist regimes. So when Eric Koniger wanted to implement what he called the Chinese solution, no one in the power bureau of the GDR would have followed. No, they lost their political nerve. This was a system on the edge, perhaps, to begin with. <coughs> and it's not, it's not just simply Mr. Gorbachev or other. In fact, China has a huge responsibility as, in its own actions for the end of communism in Europe. And uh, that's, an, uh, I, I think it's not, you know, the only person in Eastern Europe who tried to follow the Chinese solution was Mr. Ceausescu. And that ended very badly on Christmas Eve, as I recall, of 1989. Right over here. What? Make it really short, because we're at Next question. Just very short. Um, the U.S. has uh, seen itself as leading uh, over many years 
created kind of an international liberal order, the Soviet Union, the world communism. Did China lead for what purpose? In other words, you, you talk about can China lead? Your answer is yes. But my question is for, for what ends? For what purpose? <coughs> it's a good, that's a great question because you could have China leading and being seen to be the leader, say, in education, clearly in infrastructure, and in entrepreneurship. And here you get to the great treasure. One can talk about, you know, if the 20th century was an American century, it was in a part because, not perfectly by any means, people, certainly the Americans, believed that there was something called American values that had resonance with the rest of the world. I think a great challenge for China, but I think it's quite possible. At the moment, people in China really are in the middle of a very extraordinary debate on what are the values for modern China? What can we get from the past? that will be useful in the 20th century. How in the 21st century? Xi Jinping went and celebrated the birthday of Confucius on Confucius's birthday in a very dramatic way. In the way that Yuan Shikai used to. It didn't end well for Yuan Shikai. But I don't think that's, that's, a, that's a, um, a, a parallel here. I think you see a lot of people thinking very seriously. You see universities like Renda, People's University, founded as the Soviet University, now its greatest strengths are in Chinese history, in classical studies, uh, in comparative uh, political studies. Really quite an extraordinary shift. I think you see a search for what will be the defining values that are historically Chinese as well as modern in the 21st century. But I also believe that this won't be as fruitful as it could be in the absence of a more open, what the, the late 19th century was called a yenlu, a path of words. That is to say, an open capacity for people to speak directly to power and to people in power. Perfect, Thanks. perfect ending. The book is for sale. <laughs>